others. Uh, my own background and training is in trying to understand the reasons why people use political violence. And I can tell you uh, that it's a phenomenon in social science that we refer to as overdetermined, which means that it has so many causes that it's hard to isolate to a single cause. This is true at the individual level. People have all sorts of personal reasons for getting involved in violent action. Sometimes they don't do it intentionally. Sometimes they find themselves having improvised in the moment part of a violent movement. Um, other times they find themselves thinking very far ahead and, and self-selecting into violent movements um, and so forth. And so there's, there's all kinds of reasons for it. And um, they're you know, well documented in, in my field at least and in many other fields. Um, but what I want to talk about today is the, the interesting phenomenon that we've been discussing here, that nonviolent campaigns are on the rise worldwide. And what we can see from this graph is data that I've actually updated through 2014 that shows us that actually, in terms of the onsets of mass contentious action, nonviolent resistance today is just blowing violent resistance out of the water, uh, figuratively, of course. Um, and, and what you can see is that even in the first four years of the current decade, we've seen more onsets of new nonviolent mass campaigns of a maximalist nature. These are only the ones um, that are trying to you know, remove the incumbent leader from power or create territorial independence. We've seen more of these in the first four years of the current decade than in all of the 90s uh, together. Now, at the same time, what we uh, do with these data is we sometimes try to identify how many of these campaigns have in attendance with them a violent flank. And by violence, the way I define it is um, the threat of physical harm or actual physical harm against another person. Um, so what we're looking at here is whether the campaigns routinely exercise that. Um, now, I'm not talking about an event where you might have two million people at a demonstration and there's three people smashing a window. And, and that's like happens you know, pretty, uh, pretty often. But if that becomes routine, that every time that movement gets together, somebody's smashing windows or burning police cars, we code that as violent and, uh, or as a violent flank. Uh, so the reason is because we're trying to be very conservative about our coding. And if it just becomes part of the repertoire, that every time a movement is going to host an event or have an event, you're going to see that kind of action in attendance, and they're not really doing much about it, we code that as a movement having an internal violent flank. Now, there's also um, much more kind of robust violent flanks that emerge out of movements. And this would be like the, the weathermen that emerged out of the Students for a Democratic Society in the late 1960s in the US. Now, this is a group of people that was part of a large social movement that was um, kind of left wing. Um, but they didn't feel that the movement was going far enough in expressing its power. And so they thought, we're basically going to hijack this movement and we're going to turn to arms. And there was a period where um, the weathermen were committed to armed struggle. Um, that's also an intra-movement violent flank. Um, and then we also have uh, observations where it's not so much that a nonviolent movement produces new armed insurgents, but that, like it or not, they exist in the same country with armed insurgents, right? So this is like the Philippines, where the people power movement was doing its thing, but you also had communist insurgency in the countryside. You had um, uh, Islamist insurgency in the countryside and so forth. So sometimes, like it or not, nonviolent movements are emerging and operating in contexts where there are other armed actors also operating. And the problem for these types of movements is that sometimes their governments do not distinguish between who the nonviolent actors are and who the violent actors are. And it becomes easier for them to call everybody who's expressing political dissent part of terrorist movements. So here's the thing. The graph that I'm showing you on the board now shows us that if you can see the colors there, the red line is the percentage of nonviolent mass episodes of this nature without any violent flank. That means without people operating in the countryside who are unrelated to the movement and without the movement itself producing armed actors. What's a little bit disturbing about this is that you can see that the percentage of movements without violent flanks is declining. So even as nonviolent mass campaigns are on the rise, we're seeing a higher percentage of them 
have some degree of violent flanks. And so um, this is a real challenge, I think. It's always been a challenge for nonviolent campaigns, but it's especially a huge challenge today as more and more people start to use nonviolent mass resistance. So as I mentioned, um, the way that I define violence is fairly strict and concrete. There are many other forms of violence that are not observed or that I don't count in these data. Um, because, of course, we have things like structural violence, or we have psychological violence, and non-physical violence, and emotional violence, and other types of violence that actually are extremely difficult for us to observe. So I just go for the, the strict kind of observable definition of, um, of a practice or action that directly physically harms another. Now, of course, we know that nonviolent action is action by unarmed people uh, or persons that will apply force to another without direct violence. Um, and in the NAVCO data set, from 1900 to 2006, under 30% um, from 1900 to 2006 had a significant element of observed violence. And what I want to do here is subject these reasons to some empirical validation. And what we're going to find out, or what I'm going to hope to convince you with a little bit with these data, is that actually most of these reasons are either inaccurate or they're short-sighted in the sense that things like bringing more attention to a campaign may occur in the short term. But as we know from our discussion about strategy and tactics, attention seeking is a very short-term process goal. It does not necessarily lead to strategic success. Um, having a, a big explosion that draws a lot of people's interest is a momentary thing that often makes movements lose control of their own narrative and in fact alienate a lot of the potential supporters um, that would otherwise have participated in the campaign or third parties who otherwise would have supported the campaign. And because of that, it reduces the leverage on average for campaigns around the world. And I'm going to give you a little bit of empirical evidence that demonstrates this point. But first, let me talk about the hypotheses, because we want to be skeptics about this, right? We want to say, OK, let's take at face value the, the fairly reasonable arguments for why violence might help nonviolent movements to succeed. Um, there's some literature on this. And um, of course, uh, there's an argument that violent flanks might actually increase the leverage or power of a nonviolent campaign, first of all, by raising its profile. Um, so a lot of people say there's no way to get noticed until one uses violence. And all of a sudden, then the news cameras are there, the reporters are there, and they're paying attention. Um, the second thing that people argue that violence can do is credibly threaten that the movement can escalate, that it can increase disruption and social disorder and challenge the regime's legitimacy by actually challenging its monopoly on the use of force. It can say, look, you can't protect your people, and so you're not legitimate. William Gamson speculated that this might be the case in his seminal study of political organizations in the United States. And he did a, a very large uh, kind of long-term longitudinal study of organizations, and he indeed found that the most quote unquote militant and disruptive of these organizations were the ones that tended to get what they wanted. Now, a lot of scholars went on to say, Gamson says violence works. But actually, uh, Gamson published a second edition of his book eight years later, where he said, people have misinterpreted my finding. <laughs> the way I coded disruptive was that they were highly disruptive techniques. That is, that they were very costly for the other side, but that included strikes. And it included all kinds of highly contentious uh, nonviolent actions like sit-ins and things like that. So actually, what his finding is is that more disruption means more success, not necessarily more violence means more success. But uh, I'll tell you that if you're walking around in social movements these days, at least in the West, a lot of people use Gamson's research, his early book, as a justification for using more militant violence. Um, 
another uh, idea that's often out there, and I've, I've heard some of you bring it up uh, over the course of these couple of days, that sometimes violent flanks can make the violent people look really crazy and make the nonviolent people look great, right? <laughs> so um, the argument here is that by having a violent flank, it actually produces political space for the nonviolent movement to come forward and be the legitimate re representatives. They look like the moderates, right? Even if they have similar kind of radical goals, they look like the good guys. And um, this is an argument that, uh, that uh, Howard, or, I'm sorry, Harold Haynes has made about black insurgency in the United States. The idea that um, as soon as uh, Malcolm X and uh, kind of black nationalist movements started to build momentum in the United States, that everybody cried out for Martin Luther King and the more quote unquote moderate black opposition and gave them some more bargaining power. So that's an argument that's out there. Um, another one that's out there by Isaac and a number of his co-authors is that people who were involved in militant labor activity in the United States tended to um, maintain a much more uh, robust lifelong commitment to radical politics. And so what that means from a mobilization perspective is that there's a higher number of people who are willing to take great risks for a long period of time um, in a much more committed way than if they had just used nonviolent means. So this kind of goes back to that idea that it creates this community of potential mobilizers that are willing to take great risks for a long period of time and Howard Barrell made the argument that in South Africa, um, ANC armed struggle created an oppositional culture um, that allowed for much more kind of diverse repertoire of tactics that, um, that then uh, the anti-apartheid movement could pull from. And in fact, if you look at some of the photos of anti-apartheid activism, even when people are doing nonviolent actions like demonstrations or boycotts, Often they're wearing kind of military uniforms or militaristic uniforms, or they're even carrying cutouts of guns made with cardboard as part of the iconography um, that this sort of radical um, kind of Marxist oriented movement spread throughout society. And then in fact, it gave people confidence and pride in what they were doing and that that actually then uh, became a mobilization mechanism. So these are all the reasons why we would expect violent flanks to have positive effects for nonviolent movements. Now there are also a number of reasons why we'd expect uh, violent flanks to have negative impact on nonviolent movements and it really in some way depends on whether you buy the theory of nonviolent action that people have been talking about here. If you agree uh, that the main source of power for nonviolent campaigns and here's and their ability to attract large and diverse components of the society to the movement. And you also buy that the main point of leverage is by accessing and disrupting those pillars of support, then it makes more sense why violent flanks might undermine the political effects of these nonviolent campaigns. Gene Sharp made the argument, and many others have similarly made it, that as soon as a campaign starts to use violence and attendance with other nonviolent methods, it shifts the advantage of the campaign to a battlefield on which the regime has great competence and far more resources uh, with which to destroy it. Wendy Perlman makes this argument as well about the Palestinian national movement. She has a great book called Violence, Nonviolence in the Palestinian National Movement, which I would recommend to anybody interested in this topic or anybody not interested in this topic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in her book, uh, she makes the argument that essentially each time the Palestinian National Movement has started a mass campaign of mobilization, um, it's generally started with nonviolent action that then some more radical members or whatever uh, started to push toward violent action and then that completely uh, kind of drew back all of the gains that were achieved under the nonviolent campaign. The second thing uh, that uh, the violent flank does is it discredits all regime opponents. So this is the, the phenomenon that we see. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit yesterday about repression and the fact that the scope of repression can vary quite a lot depending on the degree to which the regime feels threatened by the opposition. Now, as soon as elements of the opposition start to use violence, 
um, whether or not the whole movement has agreed upon it. This can give the regime the pretext to declare the entire movement as a huge threat and actually to then expand widespread repression um, and engage in different types of uh, very debilitating uh, action against the campaign. It often allows the regime, for example, to invoke propaganda and provide at least some surface legitimacy to its claims that the movement is made up of criminals and terrorists rather than ordinary people exercising their basic rights. Um, and this is one of the most important things uh, that we could speculate might happen, which is that violent flanks might reduce widespread popular participation. And for me, this might actually be the most important dynamic, which is to say the dynamic that let's say there's a demonstration and let's say that there are riot police who have started to surround the demonstration. And let's say the demonstrators have said, we're peaceful, we're peaceful, we're nonviolent, we're nonviolent. Um, but then a few of the demonstrators start to attack the police. Then what happens is that there's some street fighting that goes on. The police usually have things like batons, tear gas, rubber bullets, and other types of um, crowd control uh, weapons at their disposal. Um, they're usually very well defended physically uh, through either barricades or their uniforms and uh, other defensive shields that they bring along with them. And uh, the street fighters usually don't really have much of a chance of doing really a lot of damage uh, to these opponent forces. So then what happens? People flee, right? So the, the movement uh, has mobilized a whole bunch of people to show up for this event, and a bunch of them flee. Not all of them flee. Uh, some of them might be street fighting. Some of them might be standing their ground. Uh, and a lot of them are going to flee. Now, the next time there's a demonstration, who stays away? The people who aren't able or willing to be involved in street fighting. Uh, and so a lot of times when I do research on this, I ask people, who attends the next event that you hold after one of these episodes have happened? And they say men, young men. But women, not so much. They don't bring their children. And uh, they tend not to have the elderly uh, engaged in the actions. And it's very difficult to maintain a high level of participation uh, when movements are actually, in a, in a way, provoking uh, the police to do what they do. Um, and we know, because of the law of coercive responsiveness, that the police are often going to engage in repression, or the military is going to engage in repression against the movement. The difference is that in the case I just, the scenario I just laid out, the movement provoked it in a way that uh, maybe when I showed up to participate, I didn't want it to go down, right? So I didn't get to decide when I was ready to be arrested because somebody in the movement kind of decided it. <laughs> so um, we do know that the success rates of, um, of nonviolent campaigns decline slightly when uh, they have a violent flank in attendance with them. So you can see the, the bar chart all the way to the left shows us the, the average percent rate of success of nonviolent campaigns above 50%. We see it decline to about 40% in the case where uh, there are violent flanks. And then, of course, when the movement is using only violent resistance, it's just above 20%. So how would, why, why would we see this finding? Well. There's this interesting quote from Basil Littlehart that I'm going to ask you to read um, that uh, expresses to us the way that opponents think about uh, the dissidents in their country. It's sort of interesting to think about this, that in a way it provides relief to the opponent when the movement actually turns to violence because then again it's playing on a chessboard on which the opponent has a great uh, advantage. Andre, did you? I would, I would say the same with Putin. Some people say, well, he made uh, this DNR, LNR is the use of Ukraine. <laughs> and doesn't he think that it will, there will be this Hebrew Republic sooner or too often Russia. So, who knows how to, to suppress such people republics? Violent separatism is uh, 
but he was so confused with the nonviolent movement in 2011. So it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I agree. Great. What we do in case of uh, the social movement is peaceful, nonviolent, but uh, uh, people who uh, did violent action during the movement are outsiders. Yes. Mm -hmm. who inside the movement and did that. Right. So yes. in your research, how did you uh, separate between the social movement and organizers and those people yep. in the case of assessing the successful? Yes, uh, absolutely. So we have um, the two types. We have the intra-movement violent flank that comes from within the movement, and then we have the inter-movement violent flank, which means that basically uh, contemporaneously another violent campaign starts and tries to push things along, right? Now, I'd, I agree with you that Syria more matches the intermovement dynamic. And uh, what I can say is that intermovement campaigns are actually um, uh, slightly more likely to succeed than intra-movement violent flanks. Um, but it's not a statistically significant difference. Um, and uh, what we know is that uh, these campaigns can succeed despite the onset of one of these new campaigns, if they completely outnumber them. You know, so if they just, you know, if, if they're able to maintain those very high levels of participation um, and uh, express the nonviolent action and increasingly diversify the participants and increasingly bring about security force or other types of defections, elite defections or economic elite defections, um, then they can be successful in spite of the presence of a violent flank. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a huge challenge. And I'll give a couple of examples of how movements have done that. Yeah. I have a difference. Actually, during the People's Movement of 2006 in Nepal, mm -hmm. um, there were actually two, two, let's say, two kind of movements going on. Mm -hmm. There were a non-violent movement going on where our fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts were taking part in. And there was, a, there was something different going on where a lot of teenagers were participating in the movement. Uh, taking that moment as an adventurous thing to throw stones at police and get chased away. Right. And there were a huge number of young people who were going there and throwing stones at police mm -hmm. uh, without understanding what that moment was for. Yeah. But they were really, you know, driven away by the idea that you throw stones at police and police chase you, run away like two kilometers away, right. and then again come back, throw stones and again run away. That was really adventurous for a lot of teenagers like me at that time. So yeah. And that one way, so like a lot of youths are participating in that moment, mm -hmm. but actual understanding was something different. Yeah. So how do you take this from? Yes. So I, I, here's a hypothesis. I have not yet tested it, but my my basic idea about this is that basically we see this huge explosion of nonviolent campaigns. People are getting really good at calling forth hundreds of thousands of people for demonstrations, which, as we've been talking about this whole time, is not the only method for one thing. But people have gotten really good around the world at calling forth hundreds of thousands or millions of people for demonstrations, but not so good at controlling what then happens, right? And so, uh, you know, that, that's just the learning curve of where it seems like contentious movements are today. Uh, they're good at now mobilization, but not so good at discipline. And I mean, I absolutely welcome everybody's experience about ways that they've overcome this. There are a number of different sort of practical guidebooks and handbooks on maintaining nonviolent discipline. And I'll, I'll throw out a few ideas that I've heard of um, as I proceed through this um, presentation. So I want to talk a little bit about one of the other things um, that you might speculate would actually diminish the leverage of a nonviolent campaign when a violent flank shows up. And this is actually the process of kind of defections or loyalty shifts within the regime's pillars of support. Um, so we, if you buy the idea that these are important, that it's important to sort of mobilize large numbers of people, disrupt these pillars, make them change uh, their own calculation of their personal interest and stake in the future society, um, then you might think that it would be easier to do this if the campaign is primarily nonviolent um, because people could imagine their lives in a society where this movement wins and maybe can't imagine their lives in a society where an armed movement wins. They can imagine being hurt or killed or mass retribution being engaged against them and their families. Um, and so they hang on uh, for dear life. Um, Omar Wasau, who is an American um, scholar at Princeton, uh, 
has a working paper that is really important, I think. Because in it, what he does is take data from uh, the 1960s, uh, and he looks throughout the southern United States at uh, protests, labor strikes, riots, and other types of contentious events that occurred as part of the civil rights movement. And what he found, and he, he coded each of these events as violent or nonviolent. Thank goodness, somebody did it, right? <laughs> Yay, people are, are doing it. Uh, they're, they're seeing a difference. And he coded them as nonviolent and violent. And what he then did was he took the proportion of nonviolent to violent events in each city in the South. And he looked then at how that proportion affected white voting behavior. behavior. And what he found is that the higher the proportion of violent to nonviolent events, the more white population started voting for very conservative parties that were going to protect white privilege in the South. In fact, uh, his argument is the, the cities that actually engaged in the highest levels of uh, urban uh, violent protests um, became irreparably conservative and it completely alienated uh, the voter base. This is not exactly the same as uh, you know, creating leverage in pillars of support directly, like bringing about security force defections, but it's demonstrating the difficulty with attracting diverse participants to a minority-based campaign that desperately needs, in a way, this third-party support. Um, and I'll use this opportunity to correct something I said yesterday. When I said that Gandhi, uh, said that uh, a movement always has to possess members of the oppressor class. That was actually Mary King who said that, not Gandhi. But I have to say, Mary, the two are very close together in my mind. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, some, uh, it's, it's easy to understand how I might get them confused. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is that it might decrease the, the, the backfire dynamic. The backfire dynamic, of course, is when uh, the repression has the opposite impact of what it was intended to do. So um, when the movement starts to become repressed and people watch the video that uh, the movement has meticulously collected, and what it looks like is that somebody in the movement provoked the police into violence, then it diminishes that backfire effect. It diminishes the mor moral outrage. It diminishes um, the, the sense that uh, the police violence was excessive or unjust, and it c basically undermines that particular dynamic. The other thing I want to say, which is less about strategic success and more about the long term, relates to what these societies look like after the campaign is over. And last year after FSI, I was bothered by a question, and the question was, are campaigns where there's violent flank more likely to experience civil war afterward. And so I was on the plane, and I just did a little burp, 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 and, uh, and I made this graph. And look at the difference between the probabilities of civil war onset for nonviolent campaigns and then nonviolent campaigns with violent flanks. You can see, it's kind of incredible, that it's, it's something like twice as high even for very small nonviolent campaigns, right? And then as the campaigns become larger and, and it, the participants are um, you know, making up a, a larger percentage of the overall population, we can see that nonviolent campaigns without violent flanks are still in the 25% in the range. One in four of them experiences a, a, a civil war within 10 years. But then look at the, the highest number, the, the ones that have over 5% of the population participating, almost 60% of them are um, experiencing you know, civil war within 10 years. And so we can see that even if there are short-term tactical benefits for violence, like, oh, we get more attention for five minutes. Um, oh, you know, people think that we're really radical and oppositional. Well, yeah, they think that. And then look what happens to the societies later. Right? So um, it's actually a, a really important point, I think, to hit home to people to sort of try to think long term rather than just the immediate tactical benefits. Go ahead. Yeah, I, was just to, I was just thinking of two countries, um, India, um, immediately after they got their independence, yep. now they 
yep. India um, and Pakistan. Right. You see the violence, you know, they started off with a non-violence approach. Everybody was together, nothing about religion, Hindu, Muslim. But as soon as they got independence, everything went haywire. They look, at, they look at South Africa. Yeah. They look What's at South, South Africa. Yeah. The, the black majority were militarized, you know, yeah. due to decades of um, oppression. But when um, Mandela got there with a renewed mind, you know, everybody was expecting South Africa to implode, but it didn't happen because Mandela was touching very, very sensitive, you know, places and, um, you know, I, I guess, it, I, I'm just looking at the two different um, countries. Yes, Karina, would you like to enlighten us on South Africa? Well, I hope I can. <laughs> um, so I just, I, there's been a lot of talk in the past few days about South Africa now, and uh, I, there's, I mean, with, even within South Africa, it's a very contentious subject. There's, for the first five to ten years, everyone was speaking of the Rainbow Nation and of the new South Africa, and there was this tangible hope in the air. But now, if you, si if you utter those words, in most places, you're shunned, because there is almost no sense of a new South Africa or of the end of apartheid. And um, the conditions that people are living under now for the majority of South Africans are very, very much the same as they were under apartheid. Um, and so people speak of different things. They speak of economic apartheid that people are living under now and the class differences. And, um, but I think uh, what a lot of people are thinking about now is, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debates happening about would a civil war have been better? because now people are suffering and they have nowhere to turn and there's an incredible amount of apathy and there is no organization um, and, and so I don't, I think we must be careful when we think about these things, especially, so yesterday we had this idea of post-conflict um, and thinking of a country like South Africa as post-conflict I think is, is a big mistake yeah. because there's incredible amounts of conflict, it just looks different now and not even that different, but it's, it's being framed differently than it was before. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't have an answer, but I think, I think it's important to, to uh, n not idealize often these transitions, mm -hmm. where it, it might appear to be a nonviolent and a peaceful transition, but what it often ends up being is just a different kind of repression. Can you explain to us the maybe top three reasons why people give for why a civil war would have put South Africa in a better place today? Uh, I think land redistribution would be a big one. Um, so geographically, uh, many cities in South Africa are incredibly divided. And so um, if you take Cape Town as an example, it's probably the worst. There's the mountain and there's the middle class and the upper class around the mountain and they live in an incredibly uh, easy bubble where life seems very easy and good. And then you drive 20 minutes out onto the highway and people live in absolute squalor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, people, there's, this, there's an idea that had there been more of a conflict that need, would have had to be um, uh, acknowledged. Ooh, uh, top three, you say. <laughs> Well, you can just, um, I mean, if that's the main one, that's fine. I think, I think right. that's a big one. I yeah. think also um, the fact that, so now uh, the party that is in power is our struggle party. Right. Um, and that, that transition from being a liberation party to being a, a party in power mm -hmm. is also a very tricky one. And, um, and there was a lot of, uh, well, this is my impression, is that there was a lot of as assumed ideology in the liberation movement. Um, that people assumed would translate into uh, into the government, which just didn't. Right. Economic prosperity. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me just um, point out the two things that you, you just mentioned, um, because they, they do come up, uh, not just in this case, but in other cases. So first of all, um, the idea that one would actually have been able to achieve more and more radical outcomes as a result of an armed struggle than a nonviolent struggle. Um, and then the second piece is uh, related more to the sellout dynamic, which is to say that if a revolutionary nonviolent insurrection um, becomes actually a formal political uh, organization and, and even a ruling party, that it inevitably has to compromise and sell out on some of its fundamental principles. 
And these are, you know, uh, uh, critiques that are often lodged. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, part of the, the reason why uh, Maria and I motivated the study of why civil resistance works in the way we did uh, is because we were very interested in subjecting this critique that radical outcomes come more from violence than from nonviolence to empirical tests. And what we found is that on average, that's not the case. Now that doesn't mean that in general, um, there might be some exceptions. We know that there are, but when we look at the probabilities, um, it's not really borne out in the results of our study. Um, now, of course, armed resistance sometimes works. Um, and of course, we could never deny that. But when you look at the costs in the long term of what it brings along with it, um, typically, as I mentioned, armed struggles take a lot longer. They take, um, on average, three times longer than nonviolent campaigns in their most mobilized contentious phase to bring about any type of systemic change. And actually, in the process of that, the number of people that die is actually incalculably higher than the number of people who die in nonviolent resistance campaigns. Um, and in fact, what often happens is that the new regimes also engage in mass killing to either settle scores or completely destroy any remaining opposition to them. And so uh, there's a, a very important article above and beyond this um, by a series of um, economists and political scientists named Paul Gabara and Paul Huth called Civil War Kills and Maims People Long After the Shooting Stops. You don't have to read too far into their article to figure out their thesis. Um, but basically what they say is that actually the main thing that happens in civil war is that all social and political and public service institutions are completely destroyed. They're either dismantled by the state because they have to deflect funds to the war effort, or they're dismantled in the course of war fighting such that people who do already live in very desperate conditions are deprived of even any nominal support. And what happens is that it's actually the women and children who die. So we know that actually in war, in combat, more males are killed, but more women die. Why is that? Because women in the context of war are usually displaced. They take their children and then they move around into different environments uh, where they don't have as easy access to support themselves through food and through basic necessities. They uh, therefore are typically, um, when there are women who've passed away, they take on other children uh, and they feed the children before they feed themselves, which means that there's malnourishing, which means that there's disease, that you could die from the common cold or the flu, um, where you know, three months ago you wouldn't have. Once that whole uh, cohort of women who are in that age group of first kind of the elderly women pass, then the women in, in um, you know, kind of middle age pass, and then younger and younger women are left. Well, what happens then? The men remarry younger women. Uh, the younger women die in childbirth because of complications. And then you have societies of very young women and, and orphan children um, who can't sustain themselves. So my argument is, OK, if we look at civil war, post-Civil War dynamics, what we see is people living in uh, what political scientists call the conflict trap. Because in societies where you have large male youth bulges um, and there's high levels of unemployment and poverty, you have women who are internally displaced um, and who are dying in great numbers, um, then you have a society that's predisposed to be an endless war. right? And so basically, uh, the probabilities place these countries in such desperate positions that I think it's very difficult to support the position that armed resistance would have put these places on a better track. You can see very clearly in South Africa, and it also creates an interesting dynamic because um, these things like the mass killings that you talk of, um, in uh, whether the regime uh, will be very violent towards the people, I, so we see that now in South Africa as well, where it is supposed to be the regime of the people, and what the the perception is is that the regime has simply taken on the persona of the previous regime. So it's our people, but they are now still the oppressor. 
Well, I, 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 sorry, I want to disagree with the with the ratio you're talking about. I mean, the numbers when you're saying that uh, more women eventually die more than um, uh, men. I, I can tell you, give you an example of the civil war in Nigeria. You know, a lot of guys because it's the guys that go to the war, the war front, the the one that engage in the militancy. You know. So you, you, you have scores thousands dying a day. So I don't see how um, it's you know it's just. It happened in the 1966. It's just now that the Igbos that were, the, you know, the ones that the federal troops, um, you know, the separatists that were at the receiving end. It's right. just now that you're having a, a, you know, a sign of a significant male population. Yeah. You understand? I, I understand what you're saying that yes, you have displaced women, and but you cannot. The quantum is not as much as. The people that died in the war front itself. Yeah, so actually, um, UN figures suggest a different story, um, which is in this case. Uh, by Gobara, Huth, and so forth, what they actually counted was death rates from cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is a type of um, sexually transmitted disease that is actually um, totally treatable if you have access to very basic um, health care services. And, and women die in increasing proportion after the Civil War is over, right? Yeah. After it's over. That's when the women are, yes, right? So it's, it's very, it's, it's, this is just a point to say that, like, proponents of armed struggle rarely look at the scenes of these countries in the long term. They think very short term. They think in terms of tactical effectiveness, or if they're a little uh, future-oriented, they think of strategic success as well and trying to map a plan to obtain that but they don't talk much about what happens to the country when they win. And we know from, this, from all of the data in the world that what happens when they win or when they lose is that these countries are on really, really desperate trajectories for generations. I mean, these are, you know, because as soon as these types of institutions are dismantled or destroyed, um, I mean, we just don't know how long it takes to, to restore them. Actually, yeah. when we have in Afghanistan, the same uh, explanation you just gave, uh, over the last 30 to 40 years, <clears throat> the fight going on is still in combat. It seems that militants are dying male, are dying mm -hmm. more, but when you, because the, 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 le the rate of uh, dies that uh, deaths we have for the children and women mm -hmm. are by far than what the males have. Because you see that, but the other you don't see as a, in a society, because it happens, <coughs> you don't have data on it. So that's where the, the organizations like UN and other relevant organizations working in the sector, they have the, that, that part of the information. Yeah. Probably in Nigeria, that would be a different story. But in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. what you explained is the same thing. Now, for example, in the south part of the country, <coughs> southeast of our country, the, the, the number of the um, deaths that we have, particularly for women and children, that's in a way different than what we have. That's mostly those uh, basic <coughs> needs states. Yeah. So she's talking about two things now. The, the, the violent sign, they are not post, I mean, you're not talking of post. We are talking of post, I agree with the <laughs> submission of the United States, I mean, of the UN. <laughs> That's uh, post um, the, the struggle. You know, that's post, I uh, agree. Yeah, so we have about five minutes left. What I want to do is collect a couple more comments. If, if they can be brief, that would be great. And then um, I'm going to wrap up with some suggestions. So, Anna first, and then. Um, <laughs> Unborn women being co uh, killed more is another issue in this, especially post-war situations when there is an expectation of war coming up, and like obviously women have lost their sons. There is a lot of pressure, both internally and externally, for them to actually give birth to only males, which brings to the selective abortions and a lot of women not being born in a country, which is my case in my, in Armenia. Which is Huge issue mm -hmm. where girls are not being born because uh, many factors, of course, of macho culture, but also because this is a country in a situation of mm -hmm. war where, yeah, we treasure males because they're the ones who are being killed, so we should have more of them and less women. Right. Hamsa. Mine is more of a question. Have you come across any data where it shows that uh, non violent campaigns, all violent campaigns that have been sustained for a long time? Actually, um, goes about. I don't know whether it's a, it's a standard psychological thing, but you become the person you most hate <laughs> due to the obsession with your opponent 
after you come to power, you kind of turn into that person. We, we kind of have the same kind of situation in the Maldives, and I was just thinking about what happened in South Africa. It seems like the same thing. Yes, um, so there, there's actually quite a lot of social psychological literature on uh, perpetrator-victim convergence. Um, and there's also, uh, there's even literature on uh, what's called um, perpetrator-induced traumatic uh, um, PTSD, which is uh, PITS, is what they call it. And um, this means that basically perpetrators of violence themselves actually um, become traumatized by it, and then they become victims. So it can go both ways. Um, and uh, but yes, there, there's, there's quite a lot of literature on that, which I can support uh, on the E-class. I'm going to take just two more, and then we really need to move on. Clarita. Um, I would like to react to what you said about the um, breakdown of, of the social structure. Because yes. in Myanmar <coughs> or Burma, what I notice is that um, after um, it, it's really the longest insurgency in the whole world, so it's uh, right. uh, uh, the Karens. Yes. yes. You see the emergence of parallel structure. Mm -hmm. which are of better quality mm -hmm. like schools in, in liberated areas, which taught about climate change, about mm -hmm. environmental protection, that you don't see at all in, in structural schools in Yangon. So mm -hmm. I, I see actually the emergence of, of um, what we can call more relevant and more mm -hmm. children-friendly schools compared mm -hmm. to what is happening in the center. Absolutely. So there are also positive things that come out of this. Indeed. In fact, uh, people make the same argument about the, the Black Panther Party in the United States, that the Black Panther Party, what they did do um, that was extremely effective and important was started to provide basic social services in black neighborhoods that weren't achieved otherwise. And so, yes, um, I'm definitely not here to say that everything these campaigns do is, is bad and negative and they never do anything good if they're violent. But my, my, my overall point is simply that um, you know, the, the, the decision to adopt offensive violence is often going to, um, is going to create a chain of dynamics that the movement cannot control um, and that uh, often creates serious unintentional and unanticipated consequences that we actually can really document well and that uh, sort of need to be known, I think, before people jump into it. Aaron, and then we'll keep going. I mean, I think it's a good point, but I also think that it's also a form of like manipulation and power holding for that violent group that is ultimately so much more harmful. I mean, you look at Hamas right now as well. Like that's the excuse across Gaza for Hamas is that oh they provide basic services. And so, I mean, I, I think that like yes, it's not about like oh they're good and, and evil kind mm -hmm. of thing. But I also think that we have to look at sort of the broader manipulation. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's important to bring into the conversation of nonviolent movements the importance of working with the communities that you're trying to affect and seeing those social services as an inherent and important part of the strategy for, for, for winning, essentially, because otherwise the alternative of violence makes it a lot harder and for mm -hmm. those exact reasons. Right. That, that's a good point that parallel institutions are also done by nonviolent movements um, quite often and to, to great effect. So here's just the summary of what we know now. Uh, empirically, and I have to say this field is really growing and we're learning more and more. I mean, every publication that comes out that hits my Google Scholar, um, you know, about this topic is basically more and more confirming evidence about the fact that violent flags tend to detract from the overall kind of strategic success of otherwise nonviolent movements. They diminish popular support and participation directly in nonviolent campaigns by about 17%. Uh, that's a very precise number, sorry. Um, the, the second thing is that uh, they definitely repel potential allies, as we know from Omar Wasau's uh, recent research, and it discourages, therefore, defections or loyalty shifts among key pillars of support. Um, and because of those two very important kind of depressant impacts, it would then indirectly lower the overall chances of strategic success for these campaigns. Um, we also know that there are very grave long-term uh, consequences. So what can campaigns do? Well, we've certainly seen a lot of campaigns try to ignore them, uh, which is simply to say, let's just pretend they're not there. Let's be unicorns for a second. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, I think that you know the probabilities structure to me looks like you could you could get away with that in some cases, and maybe not others. 
Um, the thing that I think has been most effective is, as I mentioned, when campaigns are able in some way to maintain very large and diverse participation, they can sort of drown out uh, the political effects of the violent flank. Um, they can certainly minimize the tactical effects um, in a number of ways. One is by um, trying to interposition. So this is the Marshall's idea, which is a great idea. Um, Ivan has a great story from Otpor, which is that um, they would have marshals assigned to any uh, mass demonstration. And their job was simply to go around and look for people that looked like they were going to start some violence against the police. Um, when they looked at these people, they would then surround them and take them to a taxi cab where they had taxis lined up along the side of the street, put them in the back and tell them, drive them 10 kilometers away. Um, so that, you know, you can actually nonviolently discipline um, different types of events, um, having anticipated that this might be a problem. Um, another thing is, uh, of course, a very controversial idea, uh, which is when movements are doing some internal monitoring, that they might turn uh, people into the authorities uh, when they think that they're going to cause trouble. Now, this is very controversial, of course, because it looks like collusion. Um, but in some cases where it may, in fact, be that the authorities themselves are the ones who are trying to provoke the violent flank, then you're just returning them to the authorities, <laughs> right? Um, in which case, uh, it could be kind of a clever technique uh, for minimizing its tactical effects. Um, there's another thing just related to training which is this sense that, as you saw on the first night when they showed the brief clip about uh, James Lawson's trainings um, in the civil rights movement, you saw that people actually tried to prepare emotionally in advance of doing any type of really disruptive action. Um, and certainly that's a way to go about it. And what it does is it prepares some people and it reveals information to others about what they're capable of doing. And there's a great story that Stephen Zunis sometimes likes to talk about. Um, which is uh, that there was a, a gentleman who came down and joined in to the civil rights movement as an ally, a white ally. And when he subjected himself to these trainings, he was a, he was a college American football player. And uh, people would come up and start beating him, and he'd turn around and punch him in the face. And they said, okay, so that's what you need to not do, right? Uh, if, when, when people start to harass you, just you know, breathe into it, calm down, just figure out a way not to react. So they try it again, and the guy comes up to him and starts harassing him, and he punches him in the face. And he says, I think this is just me. I, I, I'm one of those people that's just going to always react almost automatically and punch somebody back, OK? And they said, great. How about if you drive the bus, right? Um, so instead of being the person who's going to be right at the front lines confronting police, you're the person with great courage and great bravery and commitment who's going to drive the bus around. And that's what he did. Uh, for the whole duration of his, of his movement. So, so in, in a way, you know, it's, it's this uh, experience of discovery about one's own limits, uh, which I think is not to be underestimated, even though I don't have data to show it up. And then the final thing, of course, is minimizing the political effects. And one of the things that I think nonviolent campaigns do that for some reason they don't do as often today is denounce the violence, right? Just say, that's not us. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually politically contentious, right, in a lot of contexts because people have ideological affinities, they have personal affinities to people engaged in armed action. Um, but from a strategic perspective, campaigns can in some way inoculate themselves against the political effects by simply saying uh, that those people aren't part of our campaign and our campaign is not violent. Uh, so with that, I'm going to leave you with another quote. This one does come from Gandhi. I swear. <laughs> um, and also my contact information for those who didn't get it yesterday. We have to break up right now, but uh, let's keep talking over the break and everybody come back at 11 a.m. Thanks.